Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Six Pack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, Episode 151. bishops held their annual meeting last week in Baltimore. How'd it go? The bishop proved once again that they're as worthless, feckless, and as evil as they can be. This week we'll talk about what I think is their greatest evil. Hey, Six Pack Warriors, before you leave this episode, be sure to go to my show notes and click on the subscribe link. Just pick Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Amazon Music, whichever one you want to subscribe through. You don't have to subscribe to hear the show, but the more subscribers there are, the more these platforms will make the Cantankerous Catholic known to Catholics looking for good podcasts. And please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use. The more reviews, the more the show gets shown to Catholics looking for good podcasts. And I thank you. Before I get started, I want to thank the six-pack warriors who stepped up to the plate to keep this apostolate alive. I had asking for gifts of support, but I was really left with no choice this year. I needed $10,000, and that's what you gave me. I really appreciate it. And just so I don't have to ask for help next year, please click on the link in my show notes that says help keep the Joe Six Pack the Every Catholic Guy Apostolate alive to set up a 5 or 10 buck gift each month, or visit the store on cantankerouscatholic.com to buy books, t-shirts, and coffee mugs. Now let's talk about the USCCB criminal empire. The bishops penned and approved their long-awaited 30-page document on Eucharistic coherence titled The Mystery of the Eucharist in the Life of the Church. Did they tell abortion-promoting politicians to no longer present themselves for Holy Communion? Of course not. Canon 915 be damned. The only people who seemed surprised by this Judas-like betrayal of Christ and his church were the so-called Catholic media and many of them actually praised the bishop's document. I don't know why. There's nothing in the document that you can't find in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Once again, the booger-eating moron bishops and their booger-eating moron lapdogs in the so-called Catholic media have betrayed Christ, the Catholic Church, and millions of faithful Catholics in America. No surprise there. What came out of this is exactly what informed Catholics were expecting anyway. 
after all months ago. An inside whistleblower sent Church Militant a copy of a document from the USCCB to all the bishops telling them there wouldn't be anything in the document about child-killing politicians. I think that Michael Voris really had the best take on the Eucharistic Coherence document. After all, he was there and watched the actual vote by the sociopaths with Crozier's. On November 18th, that day's vortex was titled Bishop's Back Sacrilege. So what I want to do is play the audio from that vortex. Then I want to read an article to you from one of the bishop's victims. I'm Michael Voris coming to you from Baltimore in our continuing effort to be a pain in the rear to U.S. bishops right outside the Bishop's Hotel where just moments ago they turned into full-out enemies of Christ abandoning him to the political winds. This pro-gay, compromised, cover-up, weak men, cowardly body voted overwhelmingly to continue to allow sacrilegious Holy Communion to be given to child killers. It was almost unanimous, 222 to eight. Three bishops abstained. Apparently they can't make up their minds. For those keeping score at home, that's a 95% approval rating of doing nothing about the ongoing abomination. Another way of looking at it, 95% of the bishops voted in favor of continuing to disobey Canon Law 915. Another way of looking at it, 95% of the bishops agreed to continue supporting the blatant lie by McCarrick and Wilton Gregory back in 2004 when they lied to all the other bishops about Rome saying you cannot give Holy Communion to child killers. Within seconds of the vote being cast, the secular media couldn't wait to publish the blaring headlines. Every single outfit, New York Times, AP, Washington Post, Reuters, Wall Street Journal, CNN, all of them, with a collective reach of almost the entire nation, blew up tens of millions of phones with headlines like this. Conference of Catholic Bishops approves communion document without singling out politicians who back abortion rights. The New York Times, Catholic bishops avoid confrontation with Biden over communion. What the bishops have failed to grasp, however, is that they will be unable to avoid a confrontation with Christ, who they have betrayed once again when they die. The U.S. bishops were never going to defend the real presence in the face of their phony Catholic overlords in the Democratic Party, who have enriched their coffers beyond their wildest dreams over the immigration and refugee issue. Even brain-dead Joe Biden called it back in June, knowing full well that this sniveling bunch of pansies would never have the necessary amount of testosterone to do the right thing. The Catholic bishops are moving on this resolution that would pre pre prevent you and, and others who've um, supported abortion from receiving communion. Are you concerned about the rift in the Catholic Church, and how do you feel personally about that? That's a private matter, and I don't think that's going to happen. Thank you. Mr. During final debate on the actual document, Bishop Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas, proposed much stronger language in that final document regarding the scandal of child-killing politicians being given Holy Communion. And now, watch for yourselves just how the homosexualist modernist bureaucracy works that runs this conference when a matter of faith comes front and center. I really appreciate the uh, word scandal being used, and I appreciate that there was an amendment that uh, addressed it a little more for fully. Um, I would just uh, ask reconsideration of number 16, um, at least from the people that I hear from, and I'm sure that it's for most of us, the scandal factor is uh, quite significant, and to really address that more than just mentioning it, I believe is um, very beneficial to the faithful and to helping really promote this beautiful document on the Eucharist and really emphasizing the beauty of the real presence of the Lord among us in the Eucharist. So I just ask for further consideration or reconsideration of that number 16 regarding scandal. Mr. Rhodes. 
Thank you. And thank you, Bishop Strickland. I, I do believe we also uh, reference the passages in the Catechism in a footnote as well, don't we? That we thought would, rather than lengthen the document and do a, a, a lengthier section on scandal, um, that we would, we thought it preferable, especially for the reasons of the length, to put it in a footnote for people to, if they would like to read further. Church Militant was monitoring the entire debate and vote, and as soon as it was cast, those couple hundred Judases broke for lunch. We then went downstairs ourselves at the same time, knowing we'd bump into a bunch of them. We didn't waste any time letting them know that they were traitors and had perpetrated a great scandal on the faithful. The arrogance of these men is beyond belief. The dialogue crowd wanted no dialogue. I personally said to a group of three bishops standing directly in front of us in the buffet line, what you have just done in voting for this ongoing sacrilege is scandalous. It's wicked. The three, hiding behind their face masks, all turned around and said nothing, with the exception of one who said, thank you. I said to another bishop in the dining room with a couple out, with a couple of other bishops sitting at the table with him, that voting to do what they are doing is reprehensible and they will have to answer to Christ for this. He said back, what did we vote for? I said, continuing to allow sacrilegious Holy Communion. He responded, that's not what we did. I said, well, it sure is how the media is reporting it. And he said, well, they didn't read the document. I said, really? So are you saying then, Bishop, that Joe Biden is now going to be refused Holy Communion? He said, well, that's up to his bishop. I said back, so sacrilege is okay in this diocese, but not in that diocese. And of course, he grew angry and got that whole stern face thing and just ended the conversation. Remember, this is the dialogue crowd always wanting to hear from the faithful, unless, of course, you disagree with them. Standing behind another group, I said, hey, your excellencies, why don't you talk with us? Get the smell of the sheep on you. Well, here we are, the sheep. Bah. Of course, no response. These men serve the world, and they're raging hypocrites and thieves, just like their Episcopal role model, Judas, who also handed our blessed Lord over for money. And remember, Catholics, they all came here on your dime, spending over a million dollars of your donation money. Heck, they could have voted in favor of continued sacrilege for free, just staying at home. But they would have missed the expensive meals and the feeling of being important. While the church burns, the shepherds continue to devour the flock and rejecting the central teaching of the church. The words of our blessed Lord are going to ring for eternity in their years, in their ears. Go away, I tell you, I do not know you. I think you'll agree with me that the 222 bishops who voted for this document are absolutely disgusting creatures. Well, your excellencies, make sure they pack your caskets with as much dry ice as they'll hold because you're going to need it. What really caps this whole thing off is an article titled Enough is Enough, But Is It? An article penned by an anonymous victim. The first thing that occurred to me when I saw who wrote the article was that I automatically thought that the author is a man and the article had to do with homo predators and the Catholic clergy. It's sad that I had to even think of such a thing because none of us want to know or believe that any priest would violate his vows. But what's really disgusting is that my first thought was about priestly homo predation. I wouldn't like it any more, but it would have been less disgusting if the article had been written by a woman complaining about heterosexual predation. Anyway, here's what the author wrote. With so many of our bishops being stone-cold, brain-dead, even shouting from the rooftops will not suffice to get them to resign, step down, and move aside. As a group of men whose sole job is to shepherd the Catholic Church, they have in large part failed to do their jobs, even mediocrely. As a victim of homosexual predation in my youth, I would just like to see some of the worst offenders in this lavender mafia just walk away from their posts and leave the job of shepherding to competent holy priests. Enough is enough already. I, for one, have had enough of these gay bishops in my lifetime. Our Lord tells us in the Gospels, By their fruits you shall know them, Matthew seven sixteen. 
Here in America, the hierarchy has certainly produced a tremendous amount of bad fruit. With $4 billion paid out to U.S. victims of homosexual predation, the corruption stinks to high heaven and is ample evidence of bad leadership by some truly rotten prelates. Yet despite these payouts and the hundreds of thousands of victims and millions of people worldwide who have walked away from the church, not even one of these lavender prelates has contritely resigned. I suppose they are too busy depleting the patrimony of the church for their gay lifestyle to entertain turning in their miters and living a life of penance. All these evils are devastating to the church because of the lavender crowd's full embrace of sodomy. These are all cursed and damned men if they don't show true signs of repentance before they die. Eternity for these cursed men would most certainly find them in some deep pit of hell owing to their complicity in sexual predation of their flock and the destruction of the church by their promotion of sodomy. Sacred scripture tells even a casual reader of the text that sodomy is not natural and condemned by God. Yet despite the clarity of the biblical text, many of these evil bishops ignore God's word. And if they don't themselves engage in the sin of sodomy, they give their fellow actively sodomitic clerics a pass. You hear these men bannering the BS of the political left. Love is love, you know. What absolute rot from the mouth of the devil himself who laughs at all these evil men. He does not need to tempt them for them to do his bidding. As a young victim of sodomy, you don't have to tell me gay sex is unnatural. Even animals prove this. You don't see them habitually engaging in sodomy. A species that uses its reproductive organs inaccurately, a nice way of putting it, will not reproduce. A little hint to the wise here. This is the reason why the devil promotes homosexuality. The devil hates humanity and wants an end to human beings. Sodomites cannot reproduce. End of humanity. In just one generation, there'd be one ugly end to the world. As a victim, I have suffered enough already. Today, in my senior years, I don't need to be mentally raped by the current lavender prelates who, instead of attacking the evil that is destroying the church, continue to pander to the devil of impurity. This pandering of the LGBT mob reveals the real proclivity of these men. And talk about pandering to the LGBT mob, what absolute nonsense is Pope Francis' line, Who am I to judge? Well, for starters, you're the Pope. You, as the man sitting on the chair of Peter, are supposed to uphold the dogmas of the church. While seated there, it's your job. And sodomites sodomizing one another violates multiple dogmas of the church. You may not have had the experience of being sodomized, but the actual experience of it does not feel good. And of all the insults, your seeming approval of sodomy, your validation of homosexual behavior as Pope, was the worst. Additionally insulting was Pope Francis giving an audience to the pro-sodomite priest, Father James Martin. The only audience a pontiff should have given to a priest like James Martin was an audience to strip him of his priesthood. There should be no priests running around the globe promoting sodomy, period. Sodomy is described in sacred scripture, our sacred tradition, and the church's dogma as an evil. And yet Pope Francis seemingly gave approbation to this lavender priest? Words do not suffice for this evil playing out at the highest levels of the church. Enough is enough. There have been more than enough victims of homosexual predation. There have been more than enough people just walking away from the church because of the gay or gay-friendly prelates running it. The innumerable victims of these sodomites are crying to heaven for justice. If only God will intervene on a biblical scale and cleanse the church from these lavender prelates who are destroying it. Come, Holy Spirit, and renew the face of the earth. That was an anonymous victim, and there's a link to the article in my show notes. 
Download it and pass it around to your family and friends. The church is in dire straits here in America. But the Enough is Enough prayer rally in Baltimore simultaneous to the USCCB meeting seems to have sparked a new and welcome spirit of resistance to these evil men and their criminal activities. I want to do my part in keeping up the momentum begun at the rally. So over the next three weeks, I'm going to have Michael Hitchborn on the show to talk about the rally, Stephen Brady, who's actually the father of the resistance movement, to talk about the rally and some new revelations, and Joe Gallagher. For those of you who don't know who Joe Gallagher is, he's the resistance group director at Church Militant, and he's going to talk about how you six-pack warriors can force these evil men to give us back the Catholic Church God established for us. I think you'll really like the next three episodes. The China virus lockdown suspended mass across the country. When restrictions were lifted, few Catholics returned to mass. Why? Because no matter how you slice it, American Catholics simply don't know our faith. In two different EWTN surveys of Catholics conducted in November of 2019 and February of 2020 respectively, 86% said that their religion is very important to them. Yet 82% reject at least one Catholic doctrine, 41% never go to confession, 61% don't attend Mass regularly, 70% don't believe in the real presence, 84% believe abortion should be illegal, and 55% agree with euthanasia. Clearly, American Catholics are completely or almost completely ignorant of the Catholic faith. If they weren't, these figures wouldn't be so dismal. Despite their lack of knowledge, it's nearly impossible to interest them in catechesis they need so desperately. Well, I've got a remedy for that. Introducing the What We Believe, Why We Believe It bulletin inserts, which are endorsed by Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke. Everyone reads the Sunday bulletin, and these bulletin inserts provide a thumbnail catechism lesson that is anything but typically boring catechism. They not only tell readers what the church believes, but why the church believes it. In the parishes where these bulletin inserts are already being used, parishioners love them. I know because I get emails every week telling me so. If you're a parish priest, you can get three months of what we believe, why we believe it to try it out for free. Some laity get subscriptions for their parishes as well. To learn more, click on the link in my show notes that says Six Pack System Bulletin Insert. It just requires 11 minutes of your time to see the video. Joe Six Pack, the every Catholic guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Six Pack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to the Washington Examiner. A jury acquitted Kyle Rittenhouse on all criminal charges after he shot three rioters who chased after him in Kenosha last year. Democrats, upset at the verdict, are calling for a Justice Department investigation. For Rittenhouse, the next step could be a series of lawsuits against media outlets who characterized the then 17-year-old as a vigilante and white supremacist and liken him to a school shooter. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic News Pick number 4 Hats off to the Washington Examiner. The House passed Pretender Biden's Build Back Better Act, which has a stated sticker price of $1.85 trillion, but could swell to $5 trillion if new programs like free preschool and Obamacare subsidies are extended. The legislation faces significant obstacles in the Senate, where centrist Democrat Senators Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema have been reluctant to embrace the bill. Amazing! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic news pick number three. Hats off to the Daily Wire. 
the Central European country of Austria announced they are heading into another national lockdown for 10 days. In addition, Chancellor Alexander Schallenberg announced that they will force everyone to get vaccinated. No, 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 no! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick Pick number two. two. Hats off to Newsweek. Governor Bill Lee invited police officers who might lose their jobs if they don't get vaccinated to move to Tennessee and offered to pay their moving expenses as well. Our force is one of the most professional in the country, and we won't get between you and your doctor, Lee said in a video. We believe you'd be a great fit for our state and we'll even help cover your moving expenses. Wow! That's just incredible! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick number one. Hats off to the blaze. The New York Slimes postponed an article which detailed how innocent people in Kenosha suffered from the city's riots until after the 2020 election, a former reporter revealed. The part of Kenosha that people burned in the riots was the poor, multiracial commercial district full of small, underinsured cell phone shops and car lots. It was very sad to see and hear from people who had suffered, writes former New York Slimes reporter Nellie Bowles. But the Slimes put the article on ice. An editor told me the Slimes wouldn't be able to run my Kenosha insurance debacle piece until the 2020 election. So sorry. Despicable! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. I am hard, but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. Catholics simply don't believe in the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist anymore. At least 70% of them don't anyway. And among those who do believe, very, very few show the Eucharistic Christ the respect he deserves. We're going to try something in the Catholic booth camp to begin changing that, to make you more aware. As a premium member of Church Militant, my favorite video series is called Case Files with Simon Rafe. Simon does this two-season series as if he were a Humphrey Bogart sort of gumshoe private detective. The video's better than just plain audio because of the entire set and theme, but the audio is still superlative. The series includes nine sessions about communion in the hand that I want to use for the Catholic boot camp. Then there are five others relating to the holy sacrifice of the Mass I think are quite good and certainly applicable to the Catholic boot camp audience. Before I begin the first case file entitled Manhandling God, I want to mention that there's a link in my show notes for those who want to become premium members of Church Militant. There's also a link directing you to be able to purchase Simon Rafe's case files on DVD. I think this series would make an excellent Christmas gift for any of your Catholic family members or friends. And you can get a 10% discount by being a premium subscriber, which I also wholeheartedly recommend. Now let's listen to Simon Rafe talk about manhandling God. Why do you go to Mass? It's not a trick question, not a Zen code, not some riddle. It's an honest question, and you might be surprised to learn the answer. We go to Mass in order to be in the physical presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Yes! The church says we have to go. Yes, it's an act of worship and adoration. Yes, it allows us to participate in the sacrifice of Calvary. But all of those things are achieved by being in the physical presence of God. 
And not just being in the physical presence of God. We are called to have an intimate relationship with God. And when you have an intimate relationship with someone, you are not just physically close, but you physically interact. God comes to us in the most vulnerable way. Not only does the creator of the universe make himself a man, but that man presents himself to us under the appearance of bread and wine, and he offers that bread and wine to be consumed as food. But how do we physically interact with God when we take him as food and eat his flesh and drink his blood? Having come so far, orienting the altar the right way, using beautiful sacred music, keeping reverent silence when we are not speaking the sacred language of Latin, do we risk stumbling at the last hurdle by being too familiar? I call this case, and it's a big one, the case of manhandling God. There is a Catholic maxim expressed, of course, in Latin. Lex arandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief, is the law of life. How you pray leads to what you believe, and how what you believe leads to how you live your life. The great Archbishop Fulton Sheen expressed the same sentiment when he said, if you do not live what you believe, you will end up believing what you live. C.S. Lewis, writing in the voice of the devil's screw tape, puts it even more bluntly, saying humans are animals and that whatever their bodies do affect their souls. Our bodily postures and gestures are not something external to us. We are not souls that temporarily inhabit bodies trapped in a fleshy prison. We are bodies and we are souls, a combination of the two. We can sin with our bodies, murder, violence, lying, theft, even what are euphemistically called the sins of the flesh. It is Christ's flesh, his blood shed on the cross, his body dying for us, offered to us in the Eucharist, which saves us from sin. There is no case to be made, no Catholic case at least, that what our bodies do, particularly during Mass and the reception of the Eucharist, have no effect on the disposition of our hearts, souls, and minds. No Catholic case. It's interesting to say that. During the Protestant revolt of the 16th century, many of the soi-disant reformers made it a priority to attack the Eucharist. They, at least, recognized its central importance to Catholicism. Knowing they could not immediately attack it directly and destroy belief in the real presence, they instead adopted a clever and patient tactic. Change the liturgy and prescribe the Eucharist to be received not in the traditional manner it had been received for 15 centuries, that is, on the tongue and kneeling, but rather in the new and novel manner, in the hands and standing. There are two things here our bodily posture, and how we take Christ himself. Both point to the same things, either belief in or denial of the real presence of Christ, but they point in different ways. Let's start with our posture. Should we stand or kneel? Kneeling is a traditional posture of humility, of supplication, of subordination. It is a natural posture to show such things. Even animals show a similar posture. Watch a dog or a monkey with a bigger, superior animal. The inferior crouches down, makes himself smaller. And of course, the reverse is true. Watch two cats hissing and facing off. They will arch their backs, puff themselves up so they look bigger, taller, more important. Lowering the head bowing, kneeling, even prostrating ourselves flat on the ground, they all make us smaller before someone else. They are natural gestures of humility, and we use them outside of religious contexts. Although it's perhaps unpleasant to American sensibilities, we bow before kings, curtsy to queens, kneel when proposing marriage. But it is in prayer that kneeling is most often used. Throughout scripture, we see examples of this. Moses knelt on Mount Sinai when he asked God to forgive his people. Daniel knelt down each day to pray. Solomon knelt to pray in the temple. Jarius fell to his knees when asking Jesus to save his dying daughter. St. Peter knelt when bringing the woman Tabitha back to life. Heck, our Lord himself knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray to his father the night before the crucifixion. I guess if it's good enough for Jesus... <laughs> As Pope Benedict XVI writes in his book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, the Greek word proskynin, which means to prostrate oneself and worship, occurs 59 times in the New Testament, 24 of which are in the Apocalypse, the book of heavenly liturgy, which is presented to the church as the standard for her own liturgy. There is really no case to be made we shouldn't be kneeling to pray, particularly during Mass and especially when receiving Holy Communion. 
It is a gesture both of supplication and humility. It asks for something from God, while at the same time as acknowledging not only his power, might, and glory, but also the simple fact that he is there. If we stand to receive the Eucharist, what message are we sending to others who might be watching? That the bread and wine is just bread and wine? If you told someone that bread and wine is God, would they believe you if you didn't kneel before it? And what message are our bodies sending to our minds and hearts? We might not quite be animals, but it's a rare case the devil doesn't tell at least a little bit of truth. We might not be animals, but what our bodies do certainly affects our souls. If we don't kneel before the Eucharist, the most important person we are teaching to deny the real presence is ourselves. Fortunately, the church has your back on this one. The law of the church requires a gesture of reverence to be made before the Blessed Sacrament. Kneeling is the obvious choice. Simple, direct, visually clear, humbling and supplicating, backed up by 2,000 or more years of tradition, and perhaps most importantly, fulfilling the words of St. Paul to the Philippians that, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. But a lot of people don't kneel. Perhaps they don't make a sign of reverence, or perhaps it's just the merest twitch of the head, almost a nod, like you're letting your buddy know you've seen him at the bar. Many people, perhaps most, stand to receive the Eucharist. Sometimes there are good reasons for that. Infirm people with leg or spine injuries can find it hard to kneel. As we get older, it's harder to kneel. Well, Maybe it's just harder to get back up. And God absolutely respects that. He understands the limitations of the creatures he made after all. Having said that, every time I go to Mass, I see men who stormed the beaches at Normandy and women who riveted planes coming off the line in Detroit struggle to kneel and struggle to get back up, while guys and girls who still get carded when they go by liquor saunter right along. This isn't a physical ailment, is what I'm saying. And sometimes it's very difficult to receive kneeling because the altar rails have been torn out. Time was the congregation would kneel at the altar rail and the priest, the priest, not a legion of extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, would go up and down the line and distribute the Eucharist. The design, and I use that word under advisement, of modern churches isn't conducive to the appropriate reception of the Eucharist. Almost, dare I say it, as if it were deliberate. Not all the Protestant reformers in the church are dead, is what I'm saying. You'll find yourself pressured to receive standing people, the extraordinary ministers. I call them legion, for they are many. The extraordinary ministers, other parishioners, even the priest will say you are making a scene, making a spectacle of yourself, getting in the way. You are delaying the communion line. People will trip over you. My response to all of that? Everyone should be kneeling, and everyone should be looking where they're going. And really, did you have somewhere else to be? Am I delaying you, Father, fellow Catholics? Is this physical encounter with our Lord, Savior, and Creator eating into time you had slated for something more important? I am at a loss to think what that might be, but then again, what do I know? I'm just a reactionary Catholic sitting here worshiping Jesus. Well, kneeling here, but you get the idea. All joking aside, sometimes it's difficult to receive while kneeling. We're moving in a space we don't design with a lot of people we don't control. We should certainly try to kneel while receiving and encourage the priest and others to facilitate that. But perhaps it's not always possible. We should absolutely make a gesture of reverence before the Eucharist. And the simplest, most appropriate and most visual method of doing that is by kneeling. A bigger problem, and frankly, it's a case I don't think I can close on my own, is reception in the hand. Actually, while I'm thinking about it, Jordan, I'm gonna need some help on this one. Mm. Well, I'll spin your Rolodex and see who you've got. Oh, well, yes, if you can get her. Place the call. Thank you. The problem of reception in the hand is a bigger issue because there's really no excuse. It's just as easy for the priest to put the host on your tongue as it is for him to put it in your hands. You're right there. No one's tripping over you. You're not in anyone's way. But why should we receive communion on the tongue rather than in the hand? First and foremost, it's practical. The Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, but it comes to us under the appearance of bread and wine. To all our senses, it appears as bread. It behaves like bread. It crumbles like bread. And that's the issue. 
The rubrics of mass go to great lengths to ensure not a single crumb, not a single particle of the Eucharist is lost. The priest is to hold his hands in a particular way, to clean the vessels in a particular way. Patterns and purificators exist specifically to prevent the tiniest fragment of the Eucharist from going missing. The Eucharist is Christ, and he is really, truly, and substantially present in the smallest particle. St. Cyril of Jerusalem tells us particles of the host are more valuable than gold, which is a classic example of understatement from a doctor of the church. By putting the host into a hand, and then the host then being picked up by another hand and put into the mouth, we risk fragmenting it. Small particles can break off, stick to our palms or fingers, and then be dusted off into our pockets or the pews. The entirety of the Mass is oriented around showing respect and reverence for the physical presence of Christ, and then, at the very moment of receiving him, of welcoming him into the temple of our body, we make a boneheaded decision and scatter him to the floor. And that leads to the second major issue with receiving Jesus in the hand. How many times did your mother say, don't touch that, you don't know where it's been? Well, you do know where your hands have been, and it's not nice. I'm not talking about physical cleanliness. I'm talking about what our hands, the hands of the laity, do. Have you heard the mocking expression of a priest with soft hands not roughened by physical labor? These hands were made for chalices, not calluses. Of course, the sentiment behind it is unfair. Priests work very, very hard, but it's also true. The hands of the laity are made for mundane work, things of this world. The hands of the priest are consecrated, anointed with oil during his ordination. They are set aside, marked as special, dedicated to the work of the sacraments. St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, expresses this in no uncertain terms. Out of reverence towards this sacrament, nothing touches it but what is consecrated. Hence, the corporal and the chalice are consecrated, and likewise, the priest's hand for holding this sacrament. Hence, it is not lawful for anyone else to touch it, except from necessity. For instance, if it were to fall upon the ground, or else in some case of urgency. And it's not just big, dumb oxen from the 13th century who are against the manhandling of God by the laity. Some of the holiest people of the 20th century were against it. The Jesuit, Father John Harden, put it plainly. Behind communion in the hand, I wish to repeat and make as plain as I can, is a weakening, a conscious, deliberate weakening of faith in the real presence. Whatever you can do to stop communion in the hand will be blessed by God. Mother Teresa said, Wherever I go in the whole world, the thing that makes me saddest is watching people receive communion in the hand. Now remember, this was a woman who saw unimaginable poverty and suffering in the slums of Calcutta. And the thing that made her saddest was communion in the hand. Either she was completely indifferent to human suffering, something that is patently false and could only be advanced by a weak-minded fool ignorant of her history, or communion in the hand is really, really bad, you guys. Dietrich von Hildebrand, the man called the 20th century doctor of the church by Pope Pius XII said with sorrow, there can be no doubt that communion in the hand is an expression of the trend towards desacralization in the church in general and irreverence in approaching the Eucharist in particular. Why, for God's sake, should communion in the hand be introduced into our churches when it is evidently detrimental from a pastoral viewpoint, when it certainly does not increase our reverence, and when it exposes the Eucharist to the most terrible diabolical abuses. There are really no serious arguments for communion in the hand, but there are the most gravely serious kinds of arguments against it. Unless you think these people are outliers, mad, bad, rad traditionalists unwilling to get with the times on the fringe of the church, not in tune with Rome, how about some papal quotes? Paul VI, yes, Paul VI, the Pope who oversaw the second half of the Second Vatican Council and was the man to implement many of its reforms, advised against it in his instruction, Memoriale Domini. And John Paul II said, I tell you that I am not in favor of this practice, nor do I recommend it. And in the spirit of the liturgy, Pope Benedict XVI wrote, it may well be that kneeling is alien to modern culture insofar as it is a culture, for this culture has turned away from the faith and no longer knows the one before whom kneeling is the right, indeed the intrinsically necessary gesture. The man who learns to believe learns also to kneel, and a faith or a liturgy no longer familiar with kneeling would be sick at the core. Where it has been lost, kneeling must be recovered. 
Everything about communion in the hand, receiving God like it doesn't matter if he gets trampled underfoot, receiving him in our unworthy hands, just receiving him like he's a free sample of a new whole wheat cracker at Walmart, taking him while standing up and munching distractedly while we saunter back to our pew with scarcely a dip of the head. All of this is an attempt to deny the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And yes, I say attempt to deny it. Oh, sure. Most of the people marching up and receiving Christ in their hands aren't deliberately trying to deny or obfuscate the teaching. But they are the useful idiots. They're already acting like they don't believe. Maybe they're actually beyond merely not believing in the real presence. Maybe they never knew, were never taught, never even heard of the doctrine. And even if they did, would they believe it about something that seems to be treated with about as much respect as well? The latest flavor of cookie from Toll House? No. This is why this file is so thick and why I don't think I can close it today. There was a concerted effort, an organized attempt with behind the scenes machinations and skullduggery, obfuscations, deceptions, and lies by people sworn to uphold the teaching of the church. This, more than any other of these cases, was a deliberate attempt to Protestantize the church and deny the real presence of Jesus Christ in the mass and the Eucharist. There's a lot to go through here. For now, we're going to have to leave this case open. Discover why thousands of readers worldwide turn to the Wanderer newspaper for weekly perspective and analysis of the news and events that increasingly threaten our values and our way of life. Hello, my name is Joe Matt, publisher of America's oldest national Catholic weekly newspaper, The Wanderer. If you take your Catholic faith seriously and you are concerned about the direction of our country, the ever encroaching hand of big government, the assault of the culture on the traditional family, and the threat of progressive leaders in our churches who embrace much of the current leftist culture rather than opposing it, you will find a home in the pages of The Wanderer. If you are tired of being force-fed the agenda-driven false narratives of the day by the godless dominant media and the political elite who preside within our government, our schools, and yes, in our Catholic churches, it is time for you to take a look at The Wanderer. Every week The Wanderer addresses these concerns, exposing the who, what, and the why with sound analysis and solutions to these problems that threaten the values we hold dear. Not only is The Wanderer a great source for the issues that affect our lives, but it is also a great tool to learn more about the treasures of our Catholic faith and how to defend it in this time of great moral decay. I am so confident you will like The Wanderer. For you six-packers out there, I have a special offer. For one dollar, that's one dollar, we are offering new subscribers the opportunity to receive one month's worth of issues. That's four weekly issues. Take The Wanderer for a test drive. After one month, it is nine dollars a month. You can cancel anytime you want. I hope you will take advantage of this limited offer today. Text the word NEWS to 830-331-5729 and I will send you a link to this offer or look for the link in Joe's show notes below. The Wanderer. For 154 years, unabashedly pro-life, independent, and conservative in its politics, and steadfast in its defense of Orthodox Catholicism. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. Catherine of Siena. She said, Be who God meant you to be, and you will set the world on fire. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. Benedict Arnold began his career in the Revolutionary War as a pure patriot. He was praised for his courage in the attack on Quebec. He led his troops to the heights of Quebec and planted his flag on the Plains of Abraham. He won more and more praise for his bravery in other battles and was personally commended by General Washington. But when five other officers of lower rank were promoted over him, he became bitter. His bitterness grew and didn't stop even when Washington gave him command over the fortress at West Point. He made arrangements with Major Andre to hand over to the enemy West Point Fortress without firing a single shot. 
Andre was caught and the plot discovered. Benedict Arnold escaped and ran off to England. He lived a lonely life, despised by those he betrayed and not trusted by those he betrayed them to. He died a lonesome man. Strangely, he always kept his American uniform. When he felt he was dying, he put it on, and these are his final words. Let me die in this old uniform in which I fought my battles. May God forgive me for putting on any other. You wear a uniform too, the uniform of a Catholic. When you were confirmed, you became a soldier of Christ. The Holy Spirit strengthens you against danger to salvation if you turn to him for help. In your uniform, you must do everything that's necessary to defend the Catholic faith, which is why I refer to you as six-pack warriors. Don't betray your uniform by sin and carelessness in the practice of our holy religion. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.